Well, we are um, honored to all be together in this place. Again, I have just a tremendous sense of anticipation for what the Lord has for us. Last week, man, it was fireworks in the sanctuary again, just God touching people's lives and confirming the reality that he is present with us and all we ever have to do is think about him and he's already right there. Um, And so this morning during worship, I was reflecting on something. It's not officially in the message, but it's a a very good transition. Uh, I was just appreciating that our relationship with Jesus Christ can never be taken away from us. No matter what happens, what we face, our connection to him, his commitment to us, it will never change. The Romans 12, 28 says that the kingdom of heaven is never shaken. Have you ever felt shaken by circumstances? That's the time when you lay hold of the reality of the kingdom that you're a part of. And it had not, I've never heard this before. It had never occurred to me. But this morning, my heart was overflowing with gratitude, going, wait a minute. The kingdom is never shaken because we have a king who's never shaken. And when we make him the king of our lives, he already has a plan. He already has the power. He already has the presence. And so I just want to do a quick review. We've been honoring the Lord by studying and discussing and praying about his presence this last month. And today is the final message in that series. And so whenever someone is called to do a great thing, when people are commissioned by God, Old Testament and New Testament, the most common phrase that we need to hear that he reassures us about is, I will be with you. It's what he said to Abraham. It's what he said to Jacob. It's what he said to Moses. Whenever you're going, and by the way, when he says, I'm going to be with you, don't just sit there and go, oh, I'm going to feel loved and cuddled and accepted. I'm named among the beloved. Yes, you are all of that. But he says it when you're going to face a challenge, when you're going to face adversity, when the pressure is on, that's the moment you remind yourself, he is with me. He's got my back. And then last week, we talked about the fact that we are all called to be his special treasure, his prized possession. We're called to be priests And that means a face-to-face relationship with Jesus individually, each and every one of us. There's no one else standing between you and Jesus. It's just you and him and him with you. Is that right? So we're called to be priests. The nation of Israel was called to be a nation of priests. Today, we're all still priests. But what does a priest do? How does he get in that face-to-face relationship? And we talked about praise. That we know we enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thank you for thanksgiving this. I hope your heart was filled with appreciation, thankfulness for your family, the blessings, the food, the pie, you know, that you knew how to say thank you. So we enter his gates with thanksgiving, but we enter his courts with praise. So we thank him for what he has done, but we praise him for who he is, for his character. And so through that attitude of praise, but guys, there's another step that we take. Beyond praising him and getting into his courts, he wants us right there in his presence. And today, we're going to talk about that final step of how do you not just praise the Lord, but you surrender your whole life on that altar, which is your spiritual act of worship. What is the way that you enter his presence? And I just want to challenge you, it's through prayer. So we're called to be priests, we're called to praise, but honestly, we encounter his presence most when we think about him. And we're going to talk about some creative ways of turning your heart toward the Lord and encountering him and letting him encounter you. But as a foundation, I want to read Romans 12.1. It's a verse that's common to us, but it is the heart of this message. And uh, so Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How do you present yourself? You know, yes, we come in with thanksgiving and praise, but the reality is we bring our whole selves, we abandon ourselves, we surrender ourselves to his presence, 
And when on the altar of our hearts, he, we're able to knock off the selfishness and the insecurities and the self-centeredness, and instead of having ourselves on the throne of our own hearts, we put Jesus there on the throne of our heart in an attitude of love and of surrender and submission. So there's, there's an old saying, maybe you guys have heard it, no prayer, no power, some prayer, some power, more prayer, more power. Today, I'm going to change it. I hope this isn't heresy. I'm going to say, no prayer, no presence. Some prayer, some presence. More prayer, more presence of God. Just released and revealed through your life and through his power manifested in you. How? That's a good word right there. How? So I want to remind you, because I've mentioned it a time or two, but it is a key Ho, oh, even for what we're talking about today, Brother Lawrence's book, The Practice of the Presence of God. Uh, he was a man who was very impacting in his generation, of course, and it's a wonderful little book, and it's challenging and inspiring all at the same time. But the concept that grabbed me the most, the summation of the book for me, if you don't want to read it, just remember this quote. The presence of God is the concentration of the soul's attention on God remembering he's always there. I'll always be with you. That's it. You learn how to focus your soul. You concentrate your soul. And what is that expression, that concentration of your soul? It's not just worship, because you can get distracted by worship. You can actually almost medicate yourself with worship, and, and it's a good thing, but the focusing of your soul's attention is prayer. Thinking about him. Remembering that he's always there. So I want to remind you of that. And then one of the most transformative books in perhaps the New Testament church in our times, uh, well, not exactly our times, within the last several hundred years, was this little book, The Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ by Jean Guyon. So this book inspired my prayer life more than probably any other. It gave me a practical idea of what does it mean to concentrate my soul on the Lord in prayer? And so credit where credit's due, I've got some quotes I'm going to be using, I've got some of the, the chapters that she has in this book, and I want to paint for us a picture, a practical picture, of how to excite your prayer life by encountering and responding to the presence of God. It's not just a, a letter to Santa Claus that goes to some dead letter office. Your heart's cry moves the very heart of your father moves the very presence of God to rest upon your life. And so there's a, a great quote from Augustine. He said that he had lost much time in the beginning of his Christian experience by trying to find the Lord outwardly rather than by turning inwardly. Where does Christ reside? He's in you. It's Christ in you that is your hope of glory. Why do we get so busy looking for Jesus by getting busy and doing this and going there and witnessing the other? And all of the ways that we serve him are wonderful, but if they don't flow out of a genuine connection with him, if it's not flowing from that vine where the nutrients of our spiritual life is coming up from him and producing that fruit, it's all just striving and activity. And so to try to look for him outwardly is inevitably going to be exhausting and frustrating. But when you learn the secret, the mystery of how to turn your attention inwardly toward him in faith, in gentleness that he's already there, you begin to unlock the very dynamic now of not just Jesus' soul becoming fused with your spirit, you actually increasingly become one with him. You know, and who, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And by the way, I've always taken that to be, okay, no more bad habits, no more addictions. The Son has set me free. I'm not in bondage. The enemy has no claim on me. I love all of that. But there's an aspect right now that's very personal to me. You know whom the Son sets you free from? Self. Jesus can set you free from yourself. Your obsession with your own needs and your own wants and your own fears and your own insecurity. I am so focused sometimes on myself. God set me free from me. 
And that comes from the union that we have with him that will never go away. That is the foundation and the stability of our lives. When I was a young Christian, and I was a seeker of truth, and I wanted to figure out what's going on in this crazy world, and what is love about, and what do I believe, and all of that, I saw Christians... And in my early first six months, first year, I saw something in them that just drew me, and I couldn't put words on it. But you know what it was? I knew people who didn't know the Lord, and I didn't know what they were going to do or where they were going to be next week, next month, next year. But I saw Christians who go through challenges, who have real lives, but you know what? They always seem to wind up back on their feet if they're following after Jesus, because he's going to take everything that's even intended for their destruction and use it for their growth. There's a stability in people who have a genuine connection that governs will affect the rest of your life with him when he is made the king. Can I get an amen on that one? So let, let, we're going to talk today about praying the scriptures. We're going to talk about beholding the Lord or waiting on the Lord. We're going to talk about continual prayer. That verse that has provoked so many people of praying without ceasing. How do you actually come into a lifestyle of living in the presence? And then we're going to talk to about a final stage in your prayer life that moves into a prayer of abandonment, where you abandon yourself to the Lord. And when you truly trust him with the good and the bad, the, the pretty and the ugly, when you surrender completely, you come into that place where even suffering becomes redemptive. So that's what we're going to walk through. I'm going to be, you're going to have to listen fast because I don't know of any other central theme or message that is, is, important, is as important to a dynamic, consistent, and vital walk with Jesus than this. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to move through this quick. When it comes to praying the scriptures, how many of you know God He's not a narcissist, but oh, he loves the sound of his own voice. He does. So when you're reading his word to him, he loves to reveal himself to you. He loves to begin to answer your questions and to inspire your life and to bring in strategies and godly wisdom that has integrity, that has creativity, that has excellence. Just as you're reading the scriptures, you don't read it to understand them. You read them to encounter him. So you need to learn how to honor his word in prayer in a way that begins to inform your mind and equip your spirit to have more and more of an encounter with him, not just a knowledge of him. I, I believe in Winston Churchill. I believe he existed. I can read all the biographies that I wanted about Winston Churchill and tell you I probably know more about Winston Churchill than anybody else listening to this message. But I didn't know Winston Churchill. They didn't give me a relationship with him. But scripture you can come to know in a way where now you don't just know the word of God, but you know the God of the word. And that's what praying scripture is all about. If you want a doorway to get into his presence, honor him with his word. Try it. It works. If you want to encounter him, begin to pray into the scriptures. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but in contemplative prayer, meditating on the word to begin to quiet your soul, to begin to encounter him. I'll give you the four R's. I've shared it before, but you can write them down if you want. You pick a passage of scripture and you read it, but not just to understand what it says, but you begin to read it and then read it again and read it again until the divine highlighter comes out and God says something to you. You go, oh, how come I never noticed that before? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Is he really my shepherd? Well, wait a minute. A shepherd's there to protect me and to lead me into pastures and to, besides still waters. And the shepherd has, oh my goodness, Lord. And so you read until something jumps out. And then because you want to understand him better, you read. And then when the highlighter comes out, you reflect. So the first R is read, then reflect on what the Lord is starting to show you about himself in your word and let it just, you know, Lord, how does that work? And by the way, praying with the Lord is three-dimensional. Visions are three-dimensional. As the Lord begins to show you things, you go, whoa, well, how does that apply to my marriage? What about my stinking boss 
They're so irritating to me. And the Lord will apply his word to a situation as you begin to interact with him about it. So you reflect. Oh, and then you respond. Okay, Lord, I believe you're showing me this for a purpose. What do you want me to do? Let me not be passive. When I have an encounter with you in the word, I want to reflect upon it. I want to ponder it. I want to deepen it, but I want to be in action. How do you want, do I write a letter? Do I make a call? Do we get together face to face? Do, what, what is my step to show? How, how many times have you noticed when Jesus heals somebody? You know, I was just reading today about Naaman getting uh, healed in the Jordan. And he got so irritated, you know, when, when the prophet told him, Elisha told him, okay, go and dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan. The guy's like, I've got rivers at home. You're supposed to pray for me. You're supposed to lay your hands on me. And the leprosy is supposed to go. What are you talking about? And his friends had to talk him down. Hey, is it really so hard? Why don't you try it? You say you want to be done with your leprosy. So he had to humble himself and do what offended his mind. How often does God have to offend your mind to open your heart? And so the dude goes, dips himself seven times in the river. Boom! Leprosy's gone. How many times does the Lord tell you something and you don't look for how to respond to it? To activate the faith, to activate, to show obedience to the thing that you've encountered in his word. Can I, can, this is an important principle. So to ask, well, what am I supposed to do? So it's read, reflect, respond, Anyone know the last one? Come on, Lori. You've heard this your whole life. Rest. Rest. That poor girl. How many times has she heard my stories? You know, we had Thanksgiving again, and it was the same stories over and over, but they were fresh for my sister. For my sister, they were. When, anyway, it doesn't matter. They weren't fresh for her. So uh, you, you rest. And for me, that is the hardest part of the four R's of contemplative prayer. I'm reading the word, God's revealing something to me about himself. God is challenging me to respond in faith to what he's telling me. And then you've spent that time, you've enjoyed his presence, like, see ya. There's an episode of uh, Sheldon on I want to see. Or, you know, I, oh, let me go get some food. Or, I, I don't know, I'm busy. We're going to talk about this later. But if you're already in God's presence, you've already had a rich encounter with him. Why don't you just stop and shut up for a moment and go, oh, thank you, God. It's just so good to be with you. Thank you, God. You care so much for me that you speak into my life daily and you tell me about yourself. And God, I can't get over the way you love me. And I just, you know, he doesn't just respond to his word. He's a lover. If you learn in an attitude of prayer how to just say, Lord, I love you, you're his child. When your children come and say thank you and they love you, do you go get away from me? You're irritating me right now. I've got other things I'm doing. I don't want to let you allow me. No, this magnetic, he cannot resist the heart of a lover. So you rest. And by the way, in that rest, you get recharged. In that rest, you become productive. In that rest, you get strategy. In that rest, you become so productive in an attitude of peace. Amen? So that's one way that we uh, pray the scriptures. Another way is in journaling, which is so important. Um, if you don't have an active journal life, I just encourage you. It's good to journal experiences that you've had with God, words that you've received from other people. But I've been working my way through, and I'm still working my way through the Sermon on the Mount. And now I'm praying the scriptures, but I'm talking to the Lord about it. And now my way of uh, responding is, okay, Lord, I'm going to type out what you just said. Uh, when the Lord speaks to you and you remember the word and you honor the word, the word can continue to fulfill its purpose. And what there's no better way to do it than having either a journal that you write by hand. For me, many of you know, I use OneNote. It's unbelievable. I have seven years worth of interactions with the Lord now, and I highlight the ones that I really know, like, woo, that was the still small voice. I'll put a subject matter on it, and I can go back, scroll through. You know, I, guys, I had boxes of different journals. What did the Lord say to me three years ago when I was at Bethel? What are the odds of you finding that journal entry in the stacks and stacks of yellow notepads? I don't know. I'm not that patient but I can scroll through a digital version of it and go, oh, that's so right. The Lord spoke a word to Lori years ago 
because she had a heart surgery when she was six years old, and she didn't know if it was going to limit her life expect expectancy, didn't know if she could have children because maybe her heart couldn't take it. And so she was just grieving like, Lord, I want to see my grandchildren, and I want to be there for my kids. And the Lord just spoke to her a verse, which often that talk about a sure word, when he shares a word with you that's from the Bible, you can anchor on that sucker. And he said, I will sustain you in your old age. And she took that word like, I've got a promise from God, you know. And to this day, she shared it with the family at Thanksgiving. Lori, just stand up for a quick second. Stand up real quick. Turn around. She's 60 years old. How can that be? She's getting younger as I'm getting older. I need a word from God. It doesn't make sense. And she doesn't do anything with her hair. You know, I mean, anyway, God is sustaining her because, and she wrote that sucker down. We anchor down when we learn how to pray the scripture and respond to scripture, okay? Now, we need to move beyond a rational experience of God and his presence, and we move into what Madame Guyon calls beholding the Lord or waiting upon the Lord. And we, I don't know about you, but I'm a good little Puritan. I've got that work ethic, baby. I want to produce some fruit. Make me fruity, Lord. You know, I've got to be about something. And there's an aspect to our relationship with him that isn't just rational, isn't just productive, isn't something we can show somebody else. Here's the fruit of my walk with God because of boop, 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 all this information that we get from him. So... When you're talking about learning to wait on the Lord and behold the Lord, you don't read to understand the word. At that point, you're using the word as a doorway to his presence. And once you get a sense of his presence, now, rather than trying to understand the word, you just open your heart to letting him be more in charge of that time. So here's the way Madame Guyon puts it. First, Read a passage of scripture. Once you sense the Lord's presence, the content of what you have read is no longer important. The scripture has served its purpose. It has quieted your mind. It has brought you to him. Are we all on the same page? I get so hung up on what did the Lord say and how did I respond? And I, all that's good. That's a form of prayer that I have to do. But when I'm actually in his presence... There's another aspect of, of learning to live and come to him in faith, knowing that he's there, and in stillness. Doesn't the word say, be still and know that I am God? Doesn't he say he leads us beside still waters? Why? Because we're so flippin' frantic. We're a bunch of ducks. You know, we may look peaceful on the surface, but come on, underneath, we're paddling like heck. I don't know about you. But quieting my mind and turning down the noise of my circumstances, we, we live in a culture of mass distraction. I mean, and, and, and the continual doing. So we come to his presence by faith, but we remain quiet before him when we do that. Here, here's another quote that I like quite a bit. Perhaps you'll begin to enjoy a sense of the Lord's presence. If that is the case, do not try to think of anything do not try to say anything. Do not try to do anything. As long as his, the presence of the Lord, as long as the sense of the Lord's presence continues, just remain there. Remain before him exactly as you are. When it begins to decrease the sense of his presence, call on his name or simply utter words of love to the Lord. Gently, quietly, with a believing heart. With a believing heart. That is how you stay there. So we have that face-to-face -face relationship. We know how to get there. But how do you actually stay more in his presence? Guys, this is, now this is the challenge I'm taking from this message, message and I challenge you. Because my analytical brain, my busy brain, resents this one more than anything else. Me learning to be passive before the Lord I'm just wasting my time, God. With him, can you possibly waste your time? 
if you're having a sense of his presence. And I got really convicted. I had a boss that I liked quite a bit, but he was a, a boss and he was a big intimidating guy. My former pastor, I mean, Pastor Richard is like, I think he's six five or six six and 300 pounds. And his personality is as big as his body. And so I had a weekly meeting with the dude. And uh, when I had finished through my little list, I'd look at my, my pastor and I'd go, well, anything else? I was in charge of terminating our meeting and he was my boss. And then one day I heard myself, like I had done so many times, I looked at him and I said, well, anything else? And I said, wait a minute you know what, I just realized I'm saying I'm done and I'm ready to go and I don't know if you're done. And he goes, you know what, I've always wondered about that. You know, I sometimes I've got things I want to talk to you about and you, you end our meeting. How many times do we do that in prayer? If I'm not getting something rational, if I'm not getting a revelation from the word, if I'm not getting something specific, is it just a waste of time to abide in the Lord's presence? To, and, and then as soon as that sense of his presence begins to re recede or your brain begins to get active, I love what she said. Don't do anything. Don't say anything. Just gently call his name or just gently begin to say that you love him and do it in faith. And I, how long do you think it might take for his presence, that sense of him being with you to return? And so, guys, I've known people one, one pastor at our old church, Steve Kenny, had a, a tremendous walk with God. And he lived in Kodiak, Alaska, which is a very oppressed place. And the Lord would show up, and it still blows my mind, but God, give me the grace, give me the faith, give me the wisdom. Steve would have the Holy Spirit show up in his office, and he would get whacked. He would spend hours, sometimes days, if the Lord wanted to be with him, he wouldn't leave the joint. And then he let the Lord be in charge of how long. And is it strenuous? Is it exhausting? Is it, you know, if the, if the Lord is present, you have a sense of well-being. You have a sense of all is right with the world. Why wouldn't you want to stay there? Well, because it's selfish. No! He's in charge of when he wants to be done with that time or should be. And so Steve told me one time he spent hours in his office and finally, you know, he felt that time lift. And he went to the grocery store and the presence of God was so strong on him that he looked at the cashier at the grocery store and she froze. And she couldn't talk. He couldn't, hey, you know, she just, she was immobilized with the radiance of God's presence resting on him just because he had hung out. Isn't that amazing? I, 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 won't, I won't digress into a story because there's just too much to do, but I... This concept of this beholding the Lord, waiting on the Lord, is what I believe is the foundation for moving into not just the words, but praying without ceasing, that lifestyle of living in the presence. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, I love this verse. Rejoice always, have that grateful, abounding, thankful heart. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How many of you have thought, God, how can, it's not practical. I've got a job. I've got a boss. I've got my house. I've got my kids. I've got my, you know, and, and that's where we get that weird secular and sacred mindset. Well, I spend my time with the Lord, but then, you know, I go and do my own thing when in reality, no, 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 no. I believe if you practice Lord, I'm just going to stay in your presence in that gentle way. That's what Brother Lawrence learned to do. That's what Madame Guyon is challenging us to do. By the way, this book has launched, to my knowledge, at least three and maybe four different revivals that shook their entire culture because people started to read this and begin to walk in it. And the next thing you knew, boom, the Moravian revival that lasted for 100 years. You know, the revival in, in China, the Chinese leaders credited this book. I mean, there are numerous revivals that are all just based on maintaining your connection with Jesus Christ. It's not rocket science or brain surgery. So, oh, I wanted to reverse those just for fun, but I won't do it. So learning to be in a lifestyle of continual prayer is really on that foundation, I believe, of learning how to just gently keep inviting him. You know, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, what did he say? He said, when uh, you go into your room and you shut your door. 
you encounter him in private. Why do you have to do that? Most of us, myself included, I can focus on the Lord better when it's quiet, when I have circumstantial peace around me. But that is not the end game. We should be able to know how to go to that secret place to gently call on his name, tell him that we love him, learn how to cultivate that ability to get into his presence when people are yammering in your ears or accusing you or threatening you. Come on, that's a whole different way of living. That's when you have your very best day when the worst things are happening because you know how to access that secret place through a practice. You know, it doesn't come cheap, it doesn't come easy, but there, I don't think there's anything more vital. So I'm just going to end up on this then as we're wrapping up. When you spend that time with the Lord, when that becomes your default, when you know how to practice the presence, you can enter what Madame Guyon calls the prayer of abandonment, where you finally surrender, you fully abandon yourself to God, God, I trust you. I know you are good. I know you're a God of the impossible. God, I put you on the throne of my heart and I take my worship of self or my fear of others or my fear of insert here, whatever is trying to become an idol in your life. And you learn how to put the Lord into that place. And when you learn how to abandon yourself, surrender completely to him in that trusting attitude of prayer, even suffering, even the pain of other people you love, even the pain or the confusion of your own life becomes dissolved in a prayer of abandonment. That's where you see God's redemptive purpose in it. And uh, Madame Guyon takes it to a level I can't quite get my mind around yet, but basically she says, you come to a point of realizing everything that happens in my life, good and bad is according to his will and and for a good purpose that he has. Theologically, that wrecks me. And it sounds a little bit like Calvinism, but I think there's also truth in it. And so what she says is, the truth is, not everyone is capable of severe outward self-denial. The truth is, not everyone is capable of severe outward self-denial. But everyone is capable of turning within and abandoning himself wholly to God. It's the highest activity of our soul, submitting your will to his will without an agenda, without an expectation of what's in it for me, of Lord, I'm focusing my will, recognizing your presence, and now without agenda coming to you to let you move and invade and wreck me in any way you want to wreck me because I trust you that much. So I just want to give you two simple prayers. But I I would challenge you, and I'm challenging myself, to make these more a, a consistent prayer in your life and to spend that time with him where he recharges your life by your connection with him that no one can ever take away from you. And that first prayer is, Lord, I want what you want even if it's not what I want. Give him permission to, what, what was Jesus' final prayer on the cross? I mean, he, it's, it was finished. But before that work, that finished work was done for us, he said, not my will. That was the hardest prayer, I believe, of his life because he knew what it really meant. Not my will. So Lord, I want what you want. And I give you permission, even if it's not what I want. Override my own wisdom and understanding, my own sense of comfort, my own sense of safety. Whew, are are you guys there? I I want to be there, but I want to be more there. So let's do just a repeat after me kind of prayer together. If your heart is in this, this is a prophetic act now. This is to activate a new level of faith. If, If this has challenged you at all and you want a greater experience of his presence and a surrender of your life, then just repeat after me. I want what you want, even if it's not what I want. Oh, come on. Good for you guys. Of course, you don't know what doors you just opened up, but you can trust him because he's good. There's another prayer we're going to do right now as we end, and it says, uh, I prayed this one morning, 
And I hope it does the same thing for you. And, and I want this to continually be an attitude of my heart. But one morning I got up. Do you ever have those days where you don't have to do devotions? You don't have to even think about the Lord. You just, you get up and all of a sudden, boom, the sense of his presence is with you. I love the manifest presence of God. I trust him in periods of dryness too. I know he's still there and he's doing something good. But whoo, baby, when I sense his presence. And that morning it was 5.30, dark outside, whatever. I'm in my lazy boy. And, and I had that sense of his presence. And I just said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. And Lord, I'll say anything you want me to say. And there are no limits. And in my relationship with him, he just came in such a gentle way. And all he said was, that's what I love about you. And I just died. I just, why are you so good to me, God? I don't understand. But that attitude of abandonment, that attitude of surrender and trust, so if you're willing, again, as a prophetic act, even to respond to this message, let's just do a repeat after me prayer together for that, and that'll seal this time. So, <clears throat> Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. And Lord, I'll say what you want me to say. And there are no limits. you father we just thank you today as sons and daughters the object of your affection your prized possession on the earth and we just so long to turn our hearts toward you to pour our hearts out before you but lord we want to go that next level and have you pour your heart into us and we love when you reveal things to us in your word. We love when you answer our questions. We love when we have a rational encounter with you. But God, give us greater faith to let you come and minister to us in our sleep, minister to us in rest, and even in the unknowing of what it is you're doing, that we can abandon ourselves to your will and your good purposes in our life. And Lord, we just want rapid healing, rapid growth, and greater intimacy as we learn to encounter your presence in prayer. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you all. If you have family in town, love them, on them for me, and just have a wonderful day.